Hey, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's John, and um, uh, I, you know, just thinking here that we're already in week three. This this uh, the time goes by pretty fast. So, uh, coming from you, of course, from Denver. Uh, beautiful sunny morning here in Denver. We had that cyclone bomb come through here last week. My office was closed down for a couple of days, so I was working out of my home, which was fine. Um, we did have crazy 60 to 70 mile hour wind gusts and part of my back screen door in my house totally blew off. It was it was crazy, but uh, I shouldn't complain. There were a lot of uh, drivers stranded and, and a lot of terrible things that happened. So anyways, um, so we are here in a new week. Um, and I wanted to uh, just go over uh, some things from this past week um, and discuss a little bit about the assignment for this this coming week and uh, and then talk about the reading material for module three. So you guys might recall <clears throat> in week two, we talked about uh, the legal system uh, related to healthcare. care. Um, and, you know, I mentioned, and we'll, we'll go into some of these, not all of them, some of these in, in more detail over the next few weeks. But we talked about uh, all the federal and state laws and, and, you know, how they interact with respect to healthcare governance, um, HIPAA, state privacy laws, uh, fraud and abuse laws, like the Stark law, some of the anti-physician self-referral law. Uh, anti-kickback statute, civil monetary penalty law, beneficiary inducement. Uh, those are, and the, you know, some of those are just Medicare related laws, but some of them, like the anti-kickback statute, relate to all federal health care programs. <clears throat> uh, Medicaid rules and regulations, state fraud and abuse laws, insurance regulations, uh, patient abandonment rules, which we'll talk a lo little bit about today, uh, state licensure laws, accreditation rules, uh, informed consent, Scope of practice, we'll talk a little bit about uh, medical records uh, and then clinical research, we'll talk a little bit later on in this course, but uh, the FDA and in, in all the regulations associated with uh, clinical research and medical devices and things like that. So there's an enormous amount of regulation associated with, um, with healthcare and uh, there's no way to cover all of them in eight weeks and so we'll, we'll try to touch on some of them and uh, some of them from your reading some additional discussion here in these videos and and uh, uh, if you have any questions of course please feel free to re reach out or if you want to talk through anything I'm happy to do that um, I just I'm gonna emphasize this each week throughout the course uh, because you know the, the bulk of this course is studying uh, this uh, the Itraldi case and particularly with respect to medical malpractice um, and you know the, the the assignment this past week the case description I mean it, its purpose and you'll see over the next coming weeks because you'll have different milestone assignments that um, that relate to that that case as we progress through an analysis of, of the case, the facts, the rules, um, and, and the outcome, the accountability, and so on. And so, you know, this the purpose of this last assignment was to really <clears throat> help form a basis of, of an understanding of the facts, uh, help form the basis of an understanding of um, just the facts that brought the, the parties to that stage of, of court, the facts that gave rise to certain issues, helping understand what are the material facts, what are the immaterial facts, what are the issues, what are the non-issues. And so um, so hopefully that that helped um, you distinguish between those two, those things. And so, you know, as we move on in the course, you know, like this week, we'll be talking more about the, the legal components associated with that case. Later on, we'll talk about the ethical components associated with that case. And of course, it's supposed to all build up to that, uh, the, the final milestone assignment at the end of the course. So, um, so anyways, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, with respect to that case and, and what we covered in module two, uh, really, uh, the, and it particularly is, is relevant this week, <clears throat> is the, the, the four elements of, of a, a malpractice case. And so, you know, just a reminder, there is, uh, there has to be a duty, that duty, 
uh, is that duty exists when there's a uh, physician-patient uh, relationship that's formed. There has to be uh, a breach of that duty. And so that's where we get into the standard of care argument and which we'll discuss a little bit uh, further this week. But <clears throat> as we talked about last week and you, you saw in your text, um, uh, the, the, the standard of care can vary. And, and we talked about the different arguments between, uh, you know, a plaintiff and a defendant in terms of um, what standard of care may apply in a particular situation. It, it could be very different uh, based on the location, the type of facility where the, the procedure occurred or the service occurred. Uh, the type of specialty, and I want you to think about, and I know what the text says about standard of care, and, and it's kind of that reasonable physician standard. I want you to think about it a little bit differently. I mean, I think that's right, but um, some notes. Uh, where to go? Here it is. Um, so, some thoughts I had on standard of care. Uh, you know, I want you to think about it in terms of. Um, well, and the reason I say it, the medical malpractice case is really a negligence case, right? There, and you can have all kinds of negligence cases outside of the healthcare context, and the same elements uh, for a regular negligence case, for the most part, I mean, generally, are, are those in a mal medical malpractice case. The standard of care is slightly different because of what you're dealing with and the, the high complexity of medical procedures and, and physician specialties and things like that. It's a little bit different in a malpractice case. <clears throat> when, I, when you think of standard of care, I want you to think about uh, the degree of care and skill of the average healthcare provider who practices the provider specialty, take into account the medical knowledge that is available to the physician, okay? So, you know, we've discussed before that just because a procedure goes wrong or something bad happens does not mean there is a breach in, in the standard of care at all. Um, in fact, things go wrong all the time. As many of you know, you're in the healthcare industry and, and, and on, the, on the clinical side and, and, and see that pro probably pretty often. Um, you know, it's uh, the standard of care is based on the customary practices of the average physician what the average physician would customarily or typically do in a similar circumstance, given the specialty, given the knowledge and, and research available to that physician. So that, that's where we talked about <clears throat> that the standard of care may be different in a, in a very urban hospital, like Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, neurosurgeon, uh, what information and, and research is available to that neurosurgeon at a very urban hospital may be very different than <clears throat> than a neurosurgeon who practices in uh, I don't know Waukee, Kansas, where at a small medical center the neurosurgeon is only there you know every other week to perform procedures. Uh, the the research and knowledge available to that neurosurgeon may be diff very different. The, uh, the, the counter argument to that is, uh, you know, this isn't 1950. This is, this is a day and age uh, in which we have the internet. We all have access to the same level of research and we all have the same knowledge. And so that's, I mean, that's the battle that, 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 that takes place between the plaintiff and defendant. But uh, I mean, that, that's the key. And I guess that's the point I want to get across with respect to the standard of care is that there are many very different factors. There are many variables in play with respect to what standard of care applies. Uh, that just because something goes wrong does not mean that the standard of care was breached at all. Um, in fact, the very opposite could be true. Um, there are all kinds of risks with, the, with respect to certain procedures and, and difference in various specialties um, that that are that are known or even unknown and. Uh, even maybe something, I mean, something could have been missed by the physician um, or the, spe, you know, the specialist. <clears throat> and um, if it's within the standard of care to, if that's average or it was, is something that would conceivably be missed by, uh, by the average physician, given all the other factors, uh, location, et cetera, that we discussed, then it could very well still be within the standard of care. So uh so that that's the point i want to get across on that and that will become increasingly important i know we discussed it last week but will become increasingly important uh this this week as we discuss the legal components of the itiraldi case which um 
which uh, is a good segue into the the assignment this week. I, want, I just want to discuss a little bit. You, you've probably seen in my grading that I really like. I, I mean, I just go and I like to use the rubric to grade. So I, I like to. Um, um, I just go section by section and see what you know what's necessary to get full credit for a particular section. Was that met? Yes or no? If not, what well, I'll explain a little bit, uh, and then you know so on down the line. Um, so it's for me as a reader and a grader, it's very helpful for you to uh, look at each section, uh, give me section headers on the assignment, so I know where one starts, where one ends, uh, so I know what I'm looking at. So, um, I mean, it's not necessary uh, for full credit by any means. I mean, obviously I'm looking at the substance, but it's just helpful as a reader and a grader. So, uh, anyway, so, so this week uh, we're still uh, studying the Itrali case, um, and we're specifically looking at the legal components of it. Um, later on we'll discuss the ethical <clears throat> components. But uh, if, if you look at, and I'm looking at the rubric here, uh, the guidelines in the rubric, you know, first section asks you to summarize the case, uh, this, the stakeholders involved, the problem, the time period. Um, those are all things that I'll be looking for in that first section. Uh, so make sure that you include those. Uh, the second section is the medical malpractice component, and you can see that it's broken down into five subsections. Um, the legal components of the case what was the issue, the nature of the issue, what are the rules that applied, um, you know, give, give me, uh, I mean, what's the rule that applies? Uh, there, you, see, you saw the points of error, the, the, the issues before the court, those are, those are things that you've already seen, the malpractice uh, elements, um, uh, let, let me know what, uh, what, uh, what those legal components are. Uh, the the second one, the relevant malpractice policies. I, I, there is some discussion in there about what policies uh, <clears throat> the hospital had uh, related to the issue. So um, please uh, look out for that. I think in my last class there was com some confusion about uh, malpractice policies, and, and so um, what this is, it, what this says is determine the relevant malpractice policies in place for addressing the issues within the case. And so look. Look to see what policies applied and, uh, and what were in place um, to address the issues that uh, that came up. Uh, the third was analyze the malpractice is analyze the malpractice case for the standard of care provided to the victim. Be sure to apply what the law states about standard of care to support whether or not it was breached in the case. So we've we've gone to great lengths at explaining what standard of care is. <clears throat> um, uh, the key word for me in that subsection is analyze. And so um, to me, you know, an an analysis, and this is something I've discussed before, analysis is what are the facts, what is the rule, apply the facts to that rule, what is your conclusion, right? It's, it's we discussed the IRAC method, right? The, what issue, rule, application, conclusion. And uh, so that, to me, that's an analysis. Uh, make sure that you include the material facts, not the immaterial facts, but the material facts related to the standard of care. What is the rule? Apply it, conclusion. Uh, the fourth is the uh, uh, analyze, again, important word, how the malpractice case would Im impact healthcare consumers from different cultural backgrounds. So uh, th this also caused some confusion before. There's an example there in the, uh, in the uh, explanation there in the rubric, um, but uh, you know, what, what impact, if any, did uh, uh, the fact that the plaintiff, I believe, didn't speak uh, English very well, it, you know, there's maybe some, have been some cultural differences there. So it's not addressed in great length in the case, but um, it is addressed and just take a look at that and, and, and uh, describe your analysis on what that impact might be um, generally with respect to healthcare consumers. Uh, and then assess the malpractice case for accountability. There's, there's some discussion about the distri distribution of accountability. Uh, to what extent was the healthcare provider held accountable? So uh, make sure you include that. And I think uh, that's it. So um, if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully those are some helpful tips as you uh, tackle this next piece of the milestone case. So 
you know, I, I think the the syllabus probably built, you can see this pretty easily in the syllabus, but, you know, we're studying this case throughout the course and <clears throat> each assignment, each week, each week builds upon uh, the, the, the assignment from the previous week. So, you know, last week we're talking about facts, we're talking about the issues, we're talking about the medical the, or the uh, legal components this week. And, and that'll build uh, until we get to that final um, project, so the final assignment that, that really is the culmination of all these, uh, these assignments put together. So anyways, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, some thoughts on module three, um, uh, besides the assignment that we just discussed, but you know, there, I like to go through uh, the reading material and just pick out some things that, uh, that I think might be helpful or uh, even if they're outside of the scope of our assignments or, and discussions for the week, which a lot of this is. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, um, oh, one more thing about standard of care that I, I meant to mention. Um, <clears throat> one thing that came up for me this week at work um, that I think might be helpful in terms of bringing this idea of, of standard of care in, into the medical, everyday medical context of how clinicians think, how physicians think, how uh, clinic, like chief medical officers think in terms of the, the, the provision of care within a, within a certain group or within a hospital or a healthcare facility. Uh, you know, I had an interesting discussion earlier this week. I have a, I have a client that is a multi-specialty group, physician group, that um, has a behavior health department. <clears throat> and there was some discussion about adding a service that um, you basically swab the mouth of, of the patient <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's some DNA testing. So this, the vendor is a, as a it, it basically functions as, as a lab. They do this, this DNA testing and then they come back with some assessment of, uh, of what based on the, the patient's DNA, um, how they might react better to some medications as opposed to others. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we were talking through a lot of the risks associated with this, this, um, this service, um, you know, consent, uh, what is the arrangement between the two parties? And we were talking about pretty, pretty con comprehensively about the, the issue um, and the arrangement. And, you know, it's interesting to me, the first question out of the, the, the mouth of the chief medical officer was to, to the head of the behavioral health department was, is this standard of care? Um, and, and so, you know, we, we had to put uh, pause on moving forward with this because it still needs to go through a certain level of clinical review uh, by the group, by the uh, clinical leadership uh, of the group. <clears throat> but, you know, when she asked that, I, I, I thought about this class and I thought, well, that's interesting that, you know, the first thing she thought of was, is this standard of care? Because if it is in the industry, if it is standard of care, then, yeah, we want to pursue it. We may be able to uh, arrange this relationship in a way that mitigates whatever risk we discuss. Um, and, and that would be important. Um, but if it's not standard of care and it's just something that's nice to have. Um, then we have to look at that risk a little bit differently um, and maybe not be as risk tolerant as we would be if it was standard of care. So anyways, I thought that would be interesting in the context of standard of care and, and, and sort of how clinical leadership of a, in this case, a physician group, but it applies to other, you know, healthcare facilities, hospitals, et cetera. Um, is this service or is this procedure standard of care? Uh, so that, that's the analysis that they go through and the discussion that they have. So uh, hopefully that's helpful in, in terms of putting standard of care in context with respect to new, maybe new services or new procedures um, that, that may be offered. Um, so anyways, uh, on to module three, reading, uh, physician uh, professional responsibilities. So uh, many of you are nurses and, and understand that uh, like all licensed practic practitioners, uh, physicians, um, you know, nurses, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, um, I mean, any sort of licensed professional, they're, they're all governed by some sort of state board of health or medicine. Uh, there are statutes and regulations in every state that govern, <coughs> um, that govern professional responsibility, that govern scope of practice of these licensed practitioners. Um, 
And if there's a violation, then discipline can come in a variety of ways, including public censure, um, uh, revocation of a license to the most extreme, suspension of license, uh, educational classes. I've seen quite a, quite a few things. I've actually represented uh, uh, in some of my, the best stories, which I can't really tell, but the best stories that um, that come from practicing healthcare law come from uh, defending physicians in disciplinary cases. And and uh, you know I I. I um, defended a neurosurgeon and a uh, gastroenterologist in, in physician uh, disciplinary hearings. And it's a very interesting process, but I mean, the, the, you have to look at those statutes and regulations um, to, to uh, see if the basis for the discipline is, is accurate. Um, if not, then, then, uh, um, then you, you need to, you know, you fight that and, and, and you go through a board hearing and, and uh, there's one, one of those cases we took up to state court. So you got to go through this whole administrative process to the state board. Uh, if you don't get the outcome you want, you certainly have the opportunity to appeal it um, on what's called judicial review um, to, to a state court and, and go from there. Um, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, is patient dumping and, and, and the duty to treat indigent patients. Uh, and by indigent, I mean those patients that are unable to afford their medical care. Uh, we talked a little bit about EMTALA last week, the Emergency Medical Treatment Labor Act. Uh, it's discussed later in Chapter 8. Um, of course, it imposes certain obligations on emergency departments. Um, they, they can be standalone, freestanding emergency departments, urgent care facilities, or they can be uh, hospital emergency departments. Um, and there, there's always some dispute litigation of, of whether a department meets the criteria for emergency department and, and whether, uh, so therefore, EMTALA may or may not be triggered. Um, but, you know, if, if it is triggered, <clears throat> the, uh, the emergency department ha is required <clears throat> to, first of all, not ask about insurance. Uh, they're required to <clears throat> provide a medical screening and stabilizing care uh, before their discharge or before any discussion about um, uh, about uh, um, the ability to pay uh, comes up, and so um, so the the uh, there are a lot of federal rules, a lot of guidance, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of case law on this question <clears throat> um, with respect to what is an what is a sufficient medical screening, what is stabilizing care, what is a what is a an emergency department. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there, there is actually also case law on uh, when plaintiff's attorneys try to shoehorn an EMTALA violation into a medical malpractice case, and a lot of courts don't allow that. So um, just because you don't provide medical screening or sufficient medical screening does not by itself mean you have a mal malpractice case. It may mean you have an EMTALA violation, but uh, that does not always uh, form the basis for a malpractice case, which is which is interesting. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is patient abandonment, and you'll see that uh, your your text talks a little bit about this, but it uh, doesn't really go into great depth about the elements of a patient abandonment case. Uh, very similar to any sort of negligence case, really, I mean, it's a form of medical malpractice. It's a form of negligence. It occurs when a physician terminates that physician-patient relationship. Uh, without reasonable notice or excuse <clears throat> uh, and fails to provide the patient with an opportunity to find a qualified substitute. So uh, there's generally five elements to a patient abandonment case. Uh, one is uh, a healthcare treatment was unreasonably discontinued. The termination of healthcare was contrary to the patient's will or without the patient's knowledge. The healthcare provider failed to arrange for care by another appropriate skilled healthcare provider. Uh, the fourth is a healthcare provider should have reasonably foreseen that harm to the patient would arise from the termination of care, and that's sort of the, the causation piece of, uh, of you know it's very similar to a malpractice or negligence case which has a causation element. That's it's kind of the same thing here. That's the causation element, uh, and the patient actually suffered harm or loss as a result of the discontinuance of care, which is the the harm or, or damages piece in a malpractice case. So it's very relatable, very similar um, elements um, because it really is a form of negligence if you're 
if you just tell a patient or don't even tell a patient, we're just, just I'm not answering your phone calls anymore. I'm not treating you anymore. Uh, there's, there is some, um, you know, pub, public policy concern with respect to that because uh, that leaves the patient very vulnerable and especially if they don't have notice or an opportunity to find someone who can provide them that care um, that they need. So uh, there, that's, a, that's a very important uh, piece. Um, the, there are uh, just some examples that, that I haven't dealt a lot with patient abandonment cases, but here are some examples that I've either heard of or dealt with personally um, that um, lead to liability for abandonment of, of patient uh, of a patient, uh, and these are based on some court cases as well that I saw. Um, <clears throat> the premature discharge of a patient by a physician, failure of the, of the physician to provide proper instructions before discharging the patient, which is kind of interesting. Uh, keep in mind that there are other factors that have to exist. I mean, there are other elements, <clears throat> but these are these are some of the uh, just basic facts that have led um, to uh, abandonment uh, issues. Um, this just a statement by the physician that the physician will no longer treat the patient. Uh, refusal of the physician to respond to calls uh, from the patient. The physician's leaving the patient after surgery or failing to follow up on post-surgical care. So those are all things that have, um, with other facts in, in play, uh, led to um, led to physician uh, abandonment or patient abandonment um, causes of action. <clears throat> Last thing I want to talk about is, is a little bit about privacy, and, and there's a discussion question either next week or the week after that that gives you a hypothetical scenario, and uh, uh, with respect to privacy, and asks you to analyze that whether it's a breach or not. Um, so generally, with respect to HIPAA, um, you know it, it prohibits you obviously from the, at least the privacy rule piece. Um, prohibits you from using or disclosing uh, protected health information unless an exception applies. Um, there, are, there are a lot of permissive exceptions. Generally, the three that healthcare uh, entities, covered entities, rely on are the treatment exception, payment, and healthcare operations exceptions. Um, so it's important for you to be familiar with this. My guess is that if you work in the healthcare industry, you do the annual HIPAA training uh, and so you're somewhat familiar with this. <clears throat> I'm going to refer you to another resource um, that is very helpful. Um, it's, it's, it's by the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, their Office of Civil Rights Division, which is the division that uh, regulates HIPAA and enforces HIPAA. Uh, if you just go to www.hhs.gov backslash HIPAA, that's uh, H-I-P-A-A. <clears throat> it's a great resource for basic HIPAA, privacy, security rules, a lot of great FAQs. Um, and you'll also see a lot of the, the penalty, the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights Penalties for HIPAA violations. Uh, you'll see that back in October, uh, there was the biggest uh, penalty assessed for, uh, for, a, for a breach. It was $16 million by, uh, assessed to Anthem. Um, so... Uh, take a look at that. It's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, covered entities are healthcare providers, healthcare payers, insurance companies, and healthcare clearinghouses. And so um, uh, those those are the entities and their employees, obviously, independent contractors that need to comply with, and business associates that need to comply with HIPAA. Um, the important piece, uh, two more things on HIPAA, and we'll close. Um, there's no private right of action under HIPAA. Famously, which is very interesting that, you know, if, if your health information is uh, is used or disclosed without your authorization and an exception doesn't apply, uh, you don't necessarily have the ability to go sue whoever, whatever healthcare provider uh, improperly used or disclosed your PHI. Not under HIPAA. Uh, th there are a lot of state privacy laws that allow... Um, uh, not in all states, but but in some states that allow a private cause of action under state privacy law, not under HIPAA. And uh, state attorney generals have been known to file actions against healthcare providers um, for for these sort of things. So um, so that's really important. The other thing to I just want to put it in your minds now because it'll be relevant as we have that um, discussion question about uh, breaches in HIPAA later on. 
Uh, I want you to think about, maybe look into what is a breach? What, what is a breach? Um, it is a defined term under HIPAA, and it does not necessarily mean just improper use or disclosure of, of, um, of PHI, protected health information. There's more to it than that. And so I'll just leave it there and we'll discuss it later on, but I encourage you to go look up that definition of what is a breach under HIPAA um, there is an analysis involved to determine if there was actually a breach. It's not. It is a defined term, and it's not just. Uh, it's not just as simple as uh, my PHI was used improperly, therefore it's a breach. It's not that simple. So um, look into that. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, sorry for the long video, but we had a lot to cover. I uh, hope you have a great week, um, and let's just keep moving forward. Thanks, bye.